As vehicles become increasingly more complex, ADOS calibrations are a huge opportunity for your shop. But where do you start? The most important first step is finding the right partner. When you work with Aztec, you get a true partner, dedicated to providing your business with the right tools, technology, and training you'll need to perform all dynamic and static calibrations. Aztec is the trusted calibrations partner for hundreds of businesses across the U.S. and Canada. They will build a customized roadmap for your shop to bring all calibrations in-house. Hey there, it's Jason Stahl with another episode of Under the Radar. And today's episode is brought to you by our friends at Repairify. Today, my guest is Frank Phillips, who is the Vice President of Strategy for ADES Solutions USA. Welcome, Frank. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks for having me, Jason. I appreciate the, the time you're given here and looking forward to our conversation. You're welcome. You're welcome. Uh, so, so tell me a little bit about uh, ADES Solutions USA and, and your role there. Sure, you bet. So I'm probably the newest guy on the leadership team of uh, ADES Solutions USA. I just joined uh, in January uh, with some uh, old colleagues from back in my Aber days. Uh, Jerry Cathcart is our founder and uh, chief operating officer. Uh, he kind of got the idea and the vision of ADAS Solutions uh, during the pandemic and uh, launched the company in 2022. So basically ADAS Solutions USA is a company that's focused on static calibration centers. So we kind of bucketed into three philosophies as we take the approach to support the automotive industry, primarily focused today on collision because that seems to be the, the, the folks who have the greatest knowledge in calibration. Uh, but we really focus on calibration, diagnostics, and then programming. And so when everything is perfect and everything goes the way it's supposed to go, calibrations are easy. When it doesn't go that way, which is pretty frequently, then we have to in incorporate a little diagnostic work into it too. Uh, once we get through diagnostics, oftentimes we discover that, well, Part of the process in the repair was programming some modules or replacement parts and those types of things. So that's really kind of in a nutshell what ADAS Solutions uh, USA does and our approach. And so we have static calibration uh, centers today located in Colorado, uh, in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, just almost, I mean, we're just two weeks early. We'll be launching here in uh, Texas. We've got a location here that we're just getting ready to open the doors on. Uh, and then we also have a new location coming in St. Louis, Missouri. Awesome, Frank. Thanks. And, um, you know, I, I think most body shops today know now that every car that comes in the door, they really should be doing a pre-repair scan and a post-repair scan and sometimes sometimes a calibration, depending on what the OE says. But, but not all are doing these, and, and most who are doing calibrations are, are doing them wrong. In, in fact, um, I, I read on your website... 80% of collision centers do not have the proper environment to perform accurate recalibrations. More than 80% of recalibration operations are missed or unidentified, and less than 30% of recalibrations are performed accurately. So what, in your opinion, is the major disconnect between collision repairs and ADAS technology, this mysterious, uh, you know, sometimes head-scratching technology that we've, we're still learning about? Yeah. Yeah. You know, Jason, I kind of, I, I've asked myself that a, a number of times and try to come up with what's the, like the real root, right? What's the cause and how do we get over that hill and, and get onto the path of being more successful in this space? And I've kind of boiled it down to the, the, the fact that when you think about collision repair and you kind of unwind the history of the industry, we, those of us who've been in collision for a long time, we're very visual. We look at damage to a vehicle and we physically see it. And so in our mind, we start processing what it's going to take to repair the dent, to fix the scuff in the paint, whatever that physical visibility that we can see is, that's how our brains are wired in collision. You flip to our friends in the automotive industry and they, they're wired differently, right? When they walk up to a car, they're not looking at physical damage because that's not the, the direction that they've got. They've got a scanner, they have a computer in their hands, and they're literally going to connect to that car so they can actually see what they're attempting to repair. And I think that's the differentiation between collision and automotive 
and this calibration work, diagnostics, pre-post scanning, all of that is really very inherent to automotive, right? It's something that we have had to adapt to very quickly on the collision side, but it's not muscle that we naturally have. As a, as a past instructor uh, the, at a community college that taught collision repair and adjacent to my collision repair program was our automotive service program, very clearly different folks attend those programs. And now as the industry has uh, kind of evolved, it's a commingling of both of those programs together and you have to have the skills that kind of work in both sides. Even on the auto automotive side, right? If, you, if you're just a technician, we deal with this often, you're, you're just a technician. That's, that's a horrible statement. But to, if you're an, an automotive technician and you're working on a vehicle that's been in a collision, you don't inherently have that picture in your mind of what the damage was, so you don't know where to go necessarily to, to troubleshoot. On the flip side, we have the damp, but we don't have the, the network, right? We don't have the brain visibility to see where we should go on the digital side. So that's where I think kind of where it's all kind of stemmed and has gotten us in this really goofy space of not sure what to do. And as hu we're all humans, and so as humans do, I, I had a, a, a boss um, some time ago who just taught me when I was doing innovation work and implementing quality programs, Frank, you have to make it so simple that humans will do it. And we haven't done that in this industry collectively as technology on vehicles is just really accelerated and ramped. And so I think that's where the disconnect comes. You're 100% right. We, we have this concept of pre and post scanning. We're not really great at that. We are good at performing the task, but we're not very good at consuming the result of that task. And so we talk about pre and post scan and the industry has this picture in their brain that on the collision side, we scan the car once when it comes in and we scan the car once when it goes home. End of story, we don't have to do anything else. When the reality is, is that's not true at all. We're scanning that car through the life of the repair plan 10, 15 times, 50 times if you're trying to diagnose and find a problem. So that perpetual engagement of the technology on the vehicle through the entire repair process, I think that's where we, we've got some work to do. We've got a, a big hill to climb. Uh, we're, we're, we're trying, but it's pretty rocky. Right, and you make an interesting point, Frank. I think we've brought that point up in the pages of Body Shop Business is that the collision industry is intersecting with mechanical now and intersecting with the general transportation industry, the trucking. It's all sort of yeah. overlapping now and you said something, we haven't made it simple enough, that kind of leads to my next question. You know, <laughs> um, have, have repairers been put in an unfair position by the automakers um, to fix these cars? Because, you know, technology has raced so quickly ahead, we haven't been able to keep up, and now these cars are so sophisticated. And, and frankly, even before ADAS, I think repairers had a beef with automakers making cars, not thinking about repairability when they're, building these cars. And now we've got ADOS and all this electronics and modules and sensors and cameras and whatnot. But, and, you know, it sounds a little bit like, well, there's nothing we can do about it. We need to move forward. We need to get trained and we need to buy the equipment. And, you know, complaining about it isn't going to do us any good. But I want to ask you, um, given the complication of these vehicles and the access to OEM data, which is sometimes not easy and to, to obtain and, and easy to find. And then that OEM data is, is changing a lot, very fast. And in some cases, you may have done a procedure on a vehicle, certain make model year vehicle, um, six months prior and six months after the fact, same vehicle, something's changed in the OEM specs. So- uh, Six days. <laughs> six days. You know this better than I. Yes, absolutely. So, 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 it, 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 so, have 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 the, have the always made it um, uh, you know impossible basically to keep up with this stuff or is this that not the point and we just need to figure it out? You know, it's easy to I think step outside of our comfort zone and reflect and and identify where we think the source of the problem is if we want to define it as a problem. The reality is is we we think about technology in all aspects of everything that we do in life. We, we, we want it faster. We want it better. We want it more consistently. 
and we want to think less about it in, in order to accomplish all of that. So putting blame on the manufacturer, putting blame on the collision shop for not maintaining the, the education and the tooling and the equipment in order to repair these. I don't know that that's the right approach. I think we really just have to kind of unwind the situation and think about the consumer. At the end of the day, an auto manufacturer is only viable and able to be successful if somebody purchases their product. If they're not producing a product that is appealing to the consumer, well, you know, we, we, they're not going to be successful. So I think about my days at Rivian and, and the technology that was on that, that's on a Rivian vehicle and how much the consumer appreciates that technology. It's why they purchase the vehicle. I think that has to be what we we have to all agree upon and think about. And it's not about the manufacturer doing it too quickly. It's about the manufacturer responding to who their customer is. You nailed it with the, the notion of repairability. Having worked at a manufacturer and then spent a long time on the repair side as well, going to Rivian, I'm thinking to myself, yes, we're I'm, I'm finally going to be in a position to get to influence manufacturing and we're going to make, I'm going to be able to contribute and we're going to make this car repairable. And then you get there and you get punched in the face very quickly. And you realize that that that's just not the way manufacturing works. Serviceability, repairability, it is not inherent to the, the process in which they use to build things. It, and that's true across every single item that, that we have in our life, right? And so I think we can use that as a maybe, you know, in the back of our mind justification. But the reality is, is it's reality. It's been reality for a long time. Manufacturing builds things, service fixes things. At the end of the day, that they're really not one and the same. We have to figure out how to navigate. So fortunate at Rivian and the service engineers that I was able to work with, they had a great relationship with the manufacturing engineers, the design engineers, and all of those folks to give input on serviceability as Rivian moves into their next models and their evolution of the vehicles that they have on the road. But you think about a, a brand new manufacturer like Rivian, R1T was in design for a long time before service ever came into the organization to have any input. So a lot of that stuff gets baked, right? I think it's true with every auto manufacturer. You look at the big dogs and some of the large players, they have groups of folks who are designers and, and uh, uh, manufacturers. They're siloed because of the size of the organi organization. There just isn't a direct link into the serviceability side. So we're left we've made our choice, right? We've made our choice to be on the service side of the business. We're left to figure it out. And I think we, we have to stop saying they shouldn't manufacture it to make it so difficult to repair. We just have to accept the fact that the consumer has asked for these things to be on their vehicles. We have to figure out how we also tailor our skills and our services to support what those consumers are asking for. You know, watching the industry evolve through this process has been a beautiful thing, right? Um, and it's sort of followed the evolution of a lot of other things. Um, I think our knowledge is getting better of ADOS. Uh, there's more training options. Um, the equipment is evolving to the point now where the narrative is you can do a calibration in your shop with limited space because we have this. Um, and 80% of calibrations are forward-facing calibrations anyway. So um, the equipment is evolving, and I, I think there's a, there's a push for more shops to do calibration in-house. You don't need to sub it out. So my question to you is, will that train of thought and the evolution of equipment one day eliminate the need for a body shop to um, sub their work out to a uh, ADAS Solutions USA such as yourself? Sure. So I think, Jason, uh, here's how I look at that, and I, I take it a, quite a bit deeper. I think we could just stay focused on the calibration piece and make a conversation out of it and explain why I believe that we won't get all the way there in, in, in the description that you explained. But to go just a little further and think about our industry as a whole, when I started fixing cars as a technician, I was a combo guy, right? I was the guy who fixed the dent. I was the guy who painted the dent. I was also the guy who wrote the estimate. In many cases, guys like me were also the guy that paid the bills and, and opened the door and unlocked the door and took out the trash, right? You're a one-man guy. 
Uh, first body shop I ever worked at was a, a single owner. He did all the things. The industry has evolved very rapidly, and we as an industry have to accept expertise. We have to uh, accept specialization. We have to accept that we can't be everything to everyone, and we have to challenge ourselves to become really good at the things that we like to do the most. And I think if we do that as an industry, we're going to find that a shop isn't going to effectively be able to calibrate all the cars that are in their uh, facility all of the time. We have five different levels of calibration that exist today. Think about technology and we get to the next level of autonomy, the technology that's gonna exist for that manufacturer to safely and confidently say that they, that car can drive itself. Our traditional collision centers today are not set up to be able to support what the manufacturer is going to have on those vehicles. I had a great luxury working at Rivian and had uh, a personal relationship with the ADAS engineer for on the service side at Rivian. Super brilliant man, um, just really intelligent and very thoughtful in, in the space of service when it comes to this kind of technology. And we just had a very cerebral conversation one evening after we had conducted an ADAS training uh, session. And we just chatted about what the future looks like. And we think about the definition of systems on vehicles today and we hear the government asking for automatic braking mandates on, on all vehicles by 27 right that changes the horizon of how manufacturers define these convenience features now they effectively become safety features that changes the liability position on the manufacturer tremendously therefore leaving that ability in the hands of untrained professionals to perform those critical processes that are not visible, right? We're, we're back to that early part of our conversation. These are things that nobody can actually see with your physical eyes to say the dent is now gone. We're going to have to accept that these are specialized skills required to be performed in specialized locations under specialized conditions by specialized folks. And the sooner we accept that, embrace it and develop an operation plan that works for everybody, the more success we're going to have, most importantly, the more safe our co consumers are gonna be on the road. I drive an F2, F150, uh, 23 F150 that's got Blue Cruise on it. A silly thing drives down the road all by itself. It's a big truck, right? And uh, the, the, I have a, a Hyundai uh, Palisade. It needs calibrated. It's got a self-driving feature on it and it likes to wander to the right just a little bit. Not, it's a little dangerous when you're driving down the road and you feel like you're steering into the car next to you. That's cars never, neither one of them have ever been in an accident. They've never been to a collision center. My Palisade come from the factory the way that it is. And so that's the most, the, the highest level of professionalism setting that calibration. So to be able to effectively say that this technology is gonna get simpler that's going to allow us to do it more rudimentary or more commonplace. Uh, based on my experience and my conversations with folks at Rivian and, and in my past uh, with other manufacturers, I don't see that being the case anytime soon. Obviously, everything evolves and everything gets easier, but the amount of technology and the reliance that we're going to have on that, I think is going to secure the need for this specialized segment for, for some time to come. I want all shops to be able to do their as many things as they can. The less you move a car, the better off it is in the repair process. But you're going to have those complex ones, and you need to accept that you need somebody specialized who has the knowledge and skill to perform that. That's where ADAS Solutions comes into play. So ADAS Solutions USA is obviously a big operation. How many shops do you have? Um, when we get Texas open, it'll be number 10. So we're, okay. we just completed our our uh, you know kind of proof of concept and now we're, we're ramping that quick acceleration for growth so in an industry that's already having staffing shortages and trouble finding qualified mm -hmm. technicians how are you finding yours i mean are you just offering insane salaries or bonuses or are you have you have you looked outside of the collision industry to find these people how are you staffing these shops in an industry that's already really challenged at bringing in uh, young people and other people interested in, in, in this, in the automotive uh, world. Sure, sure. You know, it's interesting, Jason, because there's a couple of schools of thought here. And I, I think it's fair to acknowledge the 
life cycle, the evolution of a collision technician, an automotive service technician, and those guys reach a pinnacle in their career that going to the shop every day isn't necessarily what they want to do. So there's an element of it asks calibrations that is appealing to them because it's a different work environment. It's a different pay schedule. It's a different complexity. It's a different approach to what they have traditionally done over the course of 20, 30 years as, as skilled technicians. Then you take the, the basic skills in that, in that they're digital and they're electronic and um, in that space of gaming per se, and that's appealing to the younger folks. I literally was just at Collin County Community College this morning in McKinney uh, speaking to the students of those two programs. I was there the last two mornings uh, speaking with the students of those programs, both auto service as well as collision. And to a tune of a, about 100 kids but or students between both of the programs over the course of a couple of days. And I got interest from, you know, a couple of dozen kids or students who came up to me to, to pick my brain a little more. Talk to me about what the role is. And so, yeah, are we going to be competing? 100%. But I think it comes back to the specialization factor. As we train these folks and as folks who are in the industry looking for skilled labor, accept the fact that we can't be everything to everyone and hone in on the skills that folks have and, and master those skills and allow them to spend more time doing the things that they thoroughly enjoy. We'll be able to navigate this and have some great success. We're not there yet because everybody is super petrified of the thought of just a starving lack of skill in the industry, right? And so they, we get a little proprietary when we start talking about skilled labor and availability and those kinds of things. But I think if we collectively as an industry just took a bit of a step back and said, there's a lot of things that people who work with their hands like to do. If we take an extra moment and identify what that person really likes to do and let them become a master of their skill, we can really start channeling folks into positions and into roles where they can excel and be really great. They'll be more productive because they spend way more time doing what they like to do and less time doing the things that are less interesting to them. At the end of the day, then we all win. And I think that's applicable across all lines of our business. We're going to continue to commingle the days of service and collision being separate the days of calibration and, and that type of stuff, it's all intertwined together very, very uh, closely. Uh, and it's going to continue to require us to accept what we're really good at and what we're not very good at and find a partner who's really good at the stuff we're not good at and work together with them. So I think that's how we accomplish this. We've been super successful at ADAS Solutions based on our company philosophy. We're, we're not the traditional commission um, pay structure. Uh, that's not our approach. We don't have to go offer big bonuses or any of that kind of thing because the atmosphere is completely different than what you would experience in, in a typical service or collision center. Very laid back and calm. Most of our, collision, our uh, static centers are, will just average 5,000 square feet. So they're not gin, ginormously big. Three to four technicians operate these facilities. There's not a, a huge amount of folks that are, uh, you know, shuffling around and managing things and a lot of chaos and that kind of thing. It's a completely different type of an environment. When you can have a conversation with somebody who's just exploring, those turn light bulbs on, right? Those That, that makes it interesting to them to ask more questions. We've been very successful to get folks in, interested in it. And we've done the whole gamut, but the, the whole perspective from somebody who's just a great at customer service, but has this desire to, to be behind a keyboard and understand what goes on inside of a computer. Great person to train and teach how to do calibrations. All the way to the service technician who's, you know, 30 year plus and really just doesn't want to bust knuckles anymore. And same with the body tech, right? He doesn't want to lift heavy frame equipment pieces to anchor cars anymore and, and they, they want to shift their focus. So we've been real fortunate to find those folks that are just looking to do something different. I think that helps because it helps us keep somebody in the industry longer, helps maybe, prevent some of the attrition that we hear about. Guys get frustrated and they leave the industry to go do something else. We could be an outlet for that to keep them within automotive. It's part of the conversation I had with the students today. I've, I've been at this silly business for 35 years. And if you look at my resume, there's a lot of stops along the way, but every single one of them ties back to 
collision repair into the automotive industry. And I think people forget about how many segments are actually out there that you can find what's interesting and appealing to you and energizes you and excites you. Very good points, Frank. I can't thank you enough for being on the podcast today, uh, enlightening us about what 8S Solutions USA is all about. You know, there's a huge demand for the services you offer in this industry, and the industry owes you a debt of gratitude for not only filling and meeting that demand, but doing calibrations and scanning and programming, programming and diagnostics and all that correctly uh, with trained people and putting people back safely on the road because after all these 8S systems are all about safety, right? So we, 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 we can't thank you enough and uh, uh, again, appreciate you filling us in on what 8S Solutions USA is all about. Thanks very much, Jason. Appreciate the time and, and uh, enjoy your, your podcast immensely. So I'm super stoked that you reached out to me to do this today. So I, I was jazzed for it. Couldn't wait for it to happen. So super excited again. Thank you for the opportunity and uh, anything I can ever do to help out along the way, uh, always happy to, to do so. I'm Jason Stahl. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching this episode of Under the Radar. For more episodes, visit BodyShopBusiness.com.